Um, if you get a chance uh, during the day, you want to visit his tables with the brains and, and talk to him about that. Um, it's pretty fascinating stuff. Um, but thank you so much, Dr. Arevich. Thanks, uh, Alan, for that kind introduction and not spending too much time that otherwise takes away from my talk. So I appreciate the very short, brief introductions. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, uh, the uh, social change agents and leaders for the greater good of the community that is this uh, aging organization. Uh, I think uh, you should be commended for trying to change the world one brain at a time and ultimately one policy member brain at a time. I go up to Capitol Hill, we give a presentation in a couple of days. Uh, when I bring the brains that I have in the back to the Capitol Hill, the Capitol Hill police will always say, thank God we finally have some brains up here. So uh, it's tougher working with politicians sometimes than uh, community agents. Uh, wanted to compliment the uh, 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 mindfulness thing that we just did. Who knew mindfulness, thinking about the moment, would be good for you as a caregiver, care recipient, or just anyone? Who knew exercise is good for the brain? I mean, we don't, our doctors, our clinicians don't really teach that. Who knew that very slow, non-impactful kinds of movements are good for the brain? Next thing you know, perhaps people will be doing more Tai Chi. Uh, and who knew laughing is good for the brain? And so uh, I, I thought it was very meaningful, the session we just had, and wanted to thank uh, the club before that. Now the clicker. Oh, okay. So you, is, yeah, just is, press the button. If you is, just, is there a pointer with it? No, no pointer, but if you just press the button, it should advance. All right, so I'm going to try to stay on time. It's always a problem. I have so much I want to share. Cutting out stuff is always painful for me, but I'll try to uh, emphasize that uh, not all patients are white, middle-class, heterosexual men. Hence, there is an African-American woman uh, suffering from dementia up there to make uh, us understand social determinants of health to a greater extent. In the little box, I have a pet peeve with the Alzheimer's Association, which I support fiercely, but it is not legally, by name, the Alzheimer's Association. It is the Alzheimer's uh, and uh, 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 Related Disorders Association. And so people with Parkinson's dementia, people with frontal temporal dementia, don't always know they can go to the Alzheimer's Association because it's so branded around that particular type of dementia. I think it needs to be much broadened uh, for the support of those that don't have Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so um, let's try that again. I think maybe here. You know, yeah, I'm just going to advance it for you. All right, next slide. Thanks. Uh, well. Yeah. Let me use this thing. <laughs> Technology can't live with it, can't live without it. All right, here's where I'm going to take you. This is the learning objectives spelled out well, to a greater extent, and where I'm going to take you, whether we finish it all or not, this will be posted uh, for you to check out. I always do my presentations about the, describing the human brain as the universe between our ears. And I relate it to successful aging, as I did last year here, and as I'll do on Capitol Hill, and so on. We'll then talk about the pandemic of behavioral and neurological disorders that are out there, and the most costly healthcare problems in America, uh, including uh, the dementias, but not entirely. We'll talk about what happens with memory as a function of aging and distinguish normal memory loss as a function of aging from, for example, the dementias and make it clear that not all dementias have memory loss. And so we're going to open that up a little bit greater. One of them. All right. Then we'll talk about the paradigm shift that is occurring in, uh, uh, here in Virginia and nationally by having the dementias viewed as a public health problem. And there is no better drum major anywhere that I know of for this public health perspective of the dimension than George Worthington, and I'll have more to say about that 
a little bit later. Uh, I think you're, you're a breath of fresh air in the Alzheimer's world. And thank you for coming and all this stuff. We'll talk about uh, amyloid beta as maybe being over-exaggerated and public health aspects of the dementias not receiving the attention that they're due. And then we'll talk about a $900,000 CDC grant that I got on challenging behaviors and the issue of challenging behaviors in general. And I'll comment on person-centered care, sometimes referred to as patient-centered care. Dr. Barnes is going to have a whole talk on that a little bit later. But so that's the kind of approach that we need to teach caregivers more about, care recipients about, and so on. So that's pretty much where I'm taking you. So now that I've told you where we're going, let's go there, and then at the end I'll tell you where we've been. All right, here's my universe between the ears. Uh, whether you have a traumatic brain injury, you have dementia, you have depression, whether you have any kind of damage to your brain, uh, it uh, impacts negatively impacts negatively the universe between our, our, our ears. I told in the very first TEDx NASA talk, I told NASA that uh, rocket science is for wimps, the real action is neuroscience. And I told them the last frontier of the last frontier of science is behavioral neuroscience. What do we mean by dementia? What do we mean by schizophrenia? What do we mean by depression? That's the last frontier of the last frontier of science. That's where we need the very best of brains and the very best of minds that are out there. And I wanted to point out the Andromeda galaxy. It's way bigger than the Milky Way galaxy. And here in Culpeper, you ought to be able to see the Andromeda galaxy as a little speck of light very easily tonight. And so open up your eyes and open up your brain and Google someplace where you can find the great square of Pegasus and how you're going to find the Andromeda galaxy. And that little speck of light left a couple million years ago from that galaxy and is now hitting your retina. And so who says you can't go back in the past? You easily can go back in the past millions of years. It's a wondrous thing, the nervous system, the eyes. All, all you have to do is open our eyes and awaken our brain and look for the wonder and the awe that is all around us. All right, next slide. So successful aging is a brain thing and it's very much a public health thing. By successful aging, we don't mean sitting in a rocking chair watching Gilligan and I on reruns all day long. That's not a successfully aged person. Successfully aged people are engaged in the world around them, like those of you who are participating here. Trying to make the world better for others as well as for self. So way more than just the absence of physical illness, successful aging requires social engagement. We'll comment later that human brain is a social brain, as pointed out by the Surgeon General. And so getting out there and working with persons on problems and doing creativity stuff and having fun is a particularly important part of uh, successful aging. It depends on public health services though. And again, we don't talk about public health as much as I think we should in the context of the dementias. So if you are successfully aged, except maybe you had ambulatory problems, and you don't have access to transportation, then it's going to be hard to go out into the community. If you're poor, uh, homeless, there are lots of uh, uh, issues there that impact negatively on successful aging, way beyond basic biology. When people come to me about what they should major in in uh, college to go to medical school, and they say, should I major in biology? The answer is absolutely not. <laughs> major in something that's not biased insofar as the biological model of disease. Learn about social contrib uh, contributors, learn about political contributors. And my God, who, who would ever think they should study philosophy of science and bioethics and all that stuff. We gotta get way beyond the basic myopic biomedical model for disease. I'm proud to say Eastern Virginia Medical School is one of the very first in the country to embrace the biopsychosocial model of disease that problems and pathologies are way more than biology. Next slide. I sh showed this last year, I show it all the time. This is a face of someone who, for me, models successful aging. Um, we adopted uh, my uh, wife's aunt, Aunt Helen. She had an intellectual disability, and when her caregiver died, and she was in her 70s, nobody wanted Aunt Helen, so we adopted Aunt Helen. She was uh, legally blind and intellectually disabled, but the high spot of every week was the National Geographic. 
and then National Geographic would come and we looked at all the beautiful pictures and, and Helen and I discovered Faye Wells photographed here. She was a contemporary of Amelia Earhart flying airplanes before women were supposed to wear pants. She was the uh, White House correspondent for the New York Tribune. She was a pretty fabulous person, according to the article, as uh, photographed here in her 90s. Now, can you imagine how fashionable she is? Check out the beads, the twinkle in her eye. That's one cool person. Big Boo Boo was like some of us would say that she is the bomb. I guess the new generation people would say she's lit. But however you describe it, she's a pretty cool person. And so I showed this picture to my medical students thereafter. And one of the students said to me, I know that woman, she's my friend's grandmother. She lives in Northern Virginia, and here's her email. And so Faye Wells and I were going back and forth about bringing her down to model successful aging at Eastern Virginia Medical School. In the last email to her, a couple of weeks before she died and did not come down, I asked her, what's the key to successful aging? And she said, to pursue the unexpected opportunities life offers. Everything important to her, she said, came totally unexpectedly, whether it was working with the, the White House or working uh, with Amelia Earhart. Pursue the unexpected opportunities. I thought that was a, a really important sentiment, worth repeating in every talk that I give. Okay, next. So, we don't fear getting old. Old, getting old is a developmental life stage. Aging is not a disease. If you're going to fear any developmental stage of aging, it would be coming to be a, a teenager. Who in their right mind would ever be a teenager again? Would not be for sure. So aging is not a disease, contrary to Silicon Valley and a lot of other places that are trying to cure aging. What we don't fear is not getting older. We fear loss of function. And that loss of function is a program loss of function that we refer to as senescence. We fear senescence. We don't fear getting old. We fear loss. We don't fear getting older. We fear losing capacity and function. And so what our goal for successful aging is to fight the senescent marauders, what I call the Visigoths. You remember the Visigoths? Even Attila the Hun was afraid of the Visigoths. They were real bad guys. And the Visigoths that promote senescence, program deterioration of function over time, relate to things that are called free radicals, kind of like some of us were back in the 60s, but not quite uh, that uh, kind of free radical. Uh, oxidative stress kinds of issues, uh, inflammatory cytokines, a bunch of uh, 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 chemicals that attack us. And so we need to protect ourselves from these marauding Visigoths. And the ways that we can do that, are you ready for this? Who knew exercise? Who knew nutrition? Who knew stress reduction? Who knew the arts? Man, we don't teach that stuff to my medical students. We teach them gizmos, gadgets, and medications. Is it any wonder they have no clue about nutrition? I'm very much looking forward to the nutrition session being presented here later. Our medical students know less about nutrition than most high school kids, frankly. And so senescence is what we fear. And the key to successful aging is a healthy lifestyle that will reduce the vulnerability to those Visigoths. Next. Now, I want to remind you of the Tithonus era and Eos, the Greek goddess Eos. She had one hang-up. She was a lover of mere mortal men. And so what was happening to her infatuated persons? They were dying on her, and that was getting to be a hassle. So she petitioned Zeus to help her out. Remember, Zeus is one slippery god where you got to be careful what you ask of Zeus. And so she asked Zeus to grant immortality to her current lover, Tithonus. And Zeus did precisely that. She did not ask to be, have him protected from senescence. She did not ask to have him protected from all of the other ravages that those Visigoths caused. She just asked for him to live forever, and that's what Zeus did. And the ravages of senescence eventually attacked him to the point where she got completely bored by Tithonus, converted him into a cricket, so Tithonus could entertain her with his chirping. That's the Tithonus there. We don't want to live forever with multiple morbidities. We'd like to live longer, but compressed morbidity. And with public health and advances in medicine, 
we're heading in the right direction insofar as compression, compressing the amount of time that we are morbidly ill, bedridden, and so on. Uh, the goal is quality of life, more so than quantity of life. Next, please. Now, let's go into this pandemic of behavioral and you know, neurological disorders. Next, please. Uh, according to the United Nations, the largest minority group on Earth, persons with disabilities. And the major cause, the most prevalent cause for chronic disabilities are psychiatric and neurological. With, for example, the World Health Organization saying the most disabling condition on Earth is depression. Yeah. Neuro and psychiatric disorders are the most prevalent and predominant cause of disabilities and persons with disabilities, according to the UN, are the largest minority group on Earth. What common denominator we have with such persons is psychosocial deprivation. We go to mosque, temple, uh, synagogue. Uh, uh, we, we're the most religious go going country on earth. God forbid we visit the caregiver next door to see if they can need a hand. God forbid we help out with a care recipient. And too often, persons with chronic disabilities are thrown away. Liberty and justice for all, all but when I work with members of Congress, I'll ask them one of the last five words of the Pledge of Allegiance, of liberty and justice for all, I'll say that's not a reality. That's a dream. There, there is not justice for all, including those with chronic disabilities who are thrown away and forgotten. And now we learned from the Surgeon General just last, uh, uh, within the past year, that psychosocial deprivation physically hurts you, and there are long-standing data showing, among other things, social deprivation injures the brain in a very profound and interesting way, and increases, among other things, the risk of the dementias. And so the human brain is the social brain, but we don't teach our medical students that because we want to teach them gizmos, gadgets, and medications, not about the importance of social affiliation. That's a public health uh, perspective there. Next. Now, there are a bunch of pathologies that affect the brain, and this is my way of organizing them so that we can sort of uh, compartmentalize and then perhaps maybe share best practices in one of these pathology areas with another. So we can have congenital brain pathologies, autism, fragile X, that cause intellectual disabilities of one type or another. We can have acquired brain injuries, most prevalent would be stroke, but also would be traumatic brain injury. I'm former head of the Virginia Brain Injury Council, and traumatic brain injury clearly is an acquired brain injury. Then we can have the degenerative pathologies, of which the dementias are one of several types. We can talk about Parkinson's disease, amyotrophic glottal sclerosis. We can talk about a bunch of these different disorders, multiple sclerosis. And then I'm going to put into the brain pathology category substance use disorders and serious mental illness. And so we tend to divorce these things and silo them out. And I'm going to try to make a case from a public health point of view that we need to integrate best practices from one with best practices from the other. Now, these are data that I put together that uh, I show policymakers as much as I can about the cost of behavioral disorders themselves uh, to the United States. It's hard to get apples to apples, and I have all the citations that I could figure out that try to uh, uh, put as much as possible apple to apple comparisons. The short uh, and, uh, the, the, the description here is that behavioral health disorders alone just the few that are here, which include dementia, account for about two trillion, with a T, two trillion dollars of healthcare costs, direct and indirect costs, to the United States government every year. Now, if you want to come up as a president and propose a, a package that's going to be two trillion dollars a year, a whole lot of people are going to say, wait a second, hold your horses, that's a lot of money. And it is a lot of money, $2 trillion a year. And the fact is about a fifth, effectively half of the whole health care expenditures situation in 2019. Behavioral health problems are at pandemic levels and are positioned to bankrupt our country. How do you spell hope? Research. We need more funding to address these issues. And research is not just for nerds, researchers for social justice and for equity all the way around. Now, I'm very proud to be uh, affiliated with the American Brain Coalition. They're going to bring me up to uh, Capitol Hill next week for a presentation related to the stuff I'm talking about. 
This is an organization that says the Alzheimer's Association isn't the only one that we need to support. National Alliance on Mental Illness is not the only one we support. The Academy of Neurology is not the only one we want to support. The Academy for Psychiatry is not. We've got to put them all under one roof and speak with one voice instead of silo them out. And so just point this out that dementias of all kinds, which we'll describe a little bit later, in very fundamental important ways, overlap with substance use disorders, overlap with serious mental illness, overlap with traumatic brain injury, and they all have an incestuous relationship with one another. If, for example, you have negative caregiving, you can't take it anymore, you're going to be at increased risk for uh, substance use disorders, increased risk for uh, depression, regardless of whether they directly cause the dementia or they are a consequence of the dementia on the caregivers. And indeed, depression is one of the risk factors now being uh, uh, promoted uh, to be addressed in the prevention of the dementia. Silos. Silos are a real problem. And what public health does is tries to break down silos. I think the American Brain Coalition is, in the words of baby boomers, the bomb. Next. All right, let's talk about what happens to some memory as we get older. And then let's talk about the dementias, which do not always have memory problems. Next slide. So this is a, a simple fact of life. Short-term memory will decline at about the age of 20. So my medical student who's a 20-year-old student versus one who's a 40-year-old student having an exam tomorrow on a thousand different parts of the brain that they're going to binge and purge as a bulimic with binge and purge food, the short-term memory capacity of the 20-year-old person is better than the short-term memory capacity of the 40-year-old person. You just can't as quickly learn material as you get older. That doesn't mean you're unable to learn material, it just means speed of acquisition declines. Now, we can have something that's normal age-related memory loss, slowing of acquisition of information. Then we can have something worse than that, it's called mild cognitive impairment. That is not a normal part of getting older. Mild cognitive impairment, MCI, is a different uh, issue and it is, among other things, a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And then finally, we can talk about the dementias. And as I've said now several times, they don't always affect memory loss. There are many kinds of dementias, not all affect memory loss. But what is dementia? Dementia is a toxic decline in intellectual function. You got normal intellectual function, and then progressively, relentlessly, and incurably, there's a decline thereafter. Because it's a decline from normal functioning, persons with intellectual disabilities are not defined as having dementia because they haven't had that normal level. But they are indeed, relative to their own baseline, inclined to, de uh, uh, to decline thereafter as well. But just because you have an intellectual disability does not mean you have dementia. Both are cognitive impairments, but different kinds of cognitive impairments. Next slide. Okay, so. Let's talk about the causes of dementia. Now, the dementias are also now in the new criteria from the American Psychiatric Association called major neurocognitive disorders. So that's going to confuse people. When people talk about major neurocognitive disorders, they're talking about dementia. And when people are talking about dementia, they're also talking about synonymously major neurocognitive disorders. So it's a potential source of confusion. But in order to have the diagnosis of dementia by way of the Alzheimer's uh, 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 criteria from the Alzheimer's Association and others, have to have an impairment in your everyday activities. If you forget where you park your car when you go to the mall, that's not a sign of impaired daily activities. It's just you can't remember where you park your car. I don't know about you guys, but I park my car the same place all the time, so I don't have to forget about it. And that works. I also park the car in the same place. Remember, it's okay to forget where you park your car. It's not okay to forget that you park your car. So that's a distinction there that we're going to make. It has to impair your daily activities. If it's not impairing your daily activities, it could be mild cognitive impairment or could be other things, but it must impact daily activities to be part of the diagnosis for a dementia. And then we have five cognitive domains, five intellectual domains, at least two of which have to be negatively impacted. Notice one of the cognitive domains is memory, but there are four others that are not. 
And so for the diagnosis of dementia two have to be affected, they or may not include dementia. And so that includes language issues, uh, judgment issues, you put your iron in the refrigerator, for example, uh, visual spatial stuff, you're uh, uh, a real hazard on the road when it comes to driving, you can't navigate visual spatial stuff, and changes in personality and behavior like apathy or agitation that you typically didn't have. You need to have two of those five, which may or may not include memory loss. So dementia is not simply a profound loss of memory depends on the type of dementia. Has to go in a progressive manner. It's a lot of persons and families going through the care and treatment of persons with dementia are regularly assessed to see if things are continuing to decline, depending on the type of dementia more rapid or slower declines occur. And you gotta rule out that the cognitive impairments are not due to other things. So we talk about the three Ds. Depression impairs cognitive function. Delirium, rapid fluctuations and uh, cognitive function impair cognitive stuff. And dementia, the three Ds, depression, dementia, and delirium. You gotta make sure that the cognitive impairment impacting uh, activities uh, of life are not due to depression. You gotta make sure they're not due to delirium. And so there are other things that have to be ruled out too, like biological issues related to certain nutritional status factors related to B12, uh, dehydration, there are lots of things that can cause profound cognitive functions not due to the dimensions. Next. All right, so how do you clinically define probable diagnosis using the Alzheimer's guide? Uh, not the American Psychiatric Association does. It has to meet the general criteria for dementia, so at least two domains have to be affected, but has to be gradual and slow in its progression. But it was probable. But, uh, Alzheimer's must include memory stuff, must include visual, spatial stuff, uh, 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 in the real world seen in driving, uh, clinically tested by just drawing uh, an analog clock, a very sensitive measure for visual spatial deficits, and must include judgment and reasoning stuff, so you're suddenly putting the iron back in a refrigerator. Has to include those three of five domains, and then at least one or the other. There has to be a change in language or change in personality. So with Alzheimer's disease, four out of the five domains for general diagnosis of dementia are required for the diagnosis of probable Alzheimer's. Next. Now, Alzheimer's disease is associated with plaques and tangles. Plaques are extracellular debris fields associated with a protein called amyloid beta. Tangles are little tubes within neurons. Uh, they get kind of twisted and gumped up, and they're associated with a protein malformation called tau. So it's a tauopathy and an amyloid beta uh, protein problem that are characteristic of Alzheimer's disease. But what a lot of people don't know is all of us are going to have plaques and tangles as a function of aging. What distinguishes persons who have Alzheimer's disease is that excess amount of plaques and tangles. Parts of the brain uh, that uh, show changes with aging will, for all of us, have plaques and tangles. It's other parts that are the ones that are going to be predominantly having these plaques and tangles. So now you can have these home tests that are available for measuring uh, markers for plaques and tangles. And so you discover by these home tests or clinical tests, or even by very expensive uh, PET imaging stuff, you got lots of plaques and or tangles. Does that mean you have dementia? No, no, no. Lots and lots of persons are diagnosed with not having dementia, but having lots of plaques and tangles. So they're a potential marker, but they are not the definitive marker for Alzheimer's disease. I'll have more to say about that here in a moment. Now let's talk about the much valued, as of last summer, new drug for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. It's an antibody that will neutralize those plaques, the extracellular debris field, with amyloid beta protein. Now I want to point out, this is not a cure for Alzheimer's, but it has received tremendous press. Tremendous press. And the effects of this intervention are modest, clinical, modest at best, and expensive. So Medicare costs are going to be around $26,000 per person, 
and each of those persons are going to have to pay around five thousand dollars out of pocket uh, to get this particular treatment this antibody treatment uh, to neutralize uh, amyloid beta now according to the kaiser family foundation kff i highly commend them for any health care policy information that you're trying to look at. Got a family foundation now just simply going by KFF. Highly respected nonpartisan organization for health care policy kinds of stuff. According to their analysis, because of the repeated testing and so on necessary to have the amyloid beta antibody treatment, the real cost is going to be around $86,000. And according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, this treatment that has at best a moderate effect is going to have to raise all Medicare premiums. All Medicare premiums. And one of the investigators quoted by the Kaiser Family Foundation stated the benefits are marginal, but the costs and the risks are real. So what do you think about this magic bullet? Hardly the magic bullet that the press has been telling us about. Clearly, it's a step in the right direction. Clearly, it is a way to intervene. But the cost-benefit stuff is debated by a number of investigators. Next slide. Now, these are some dementias that are reversible. So it's important to know there are irreversible ones, like Alzheimer's, and then there are reversible ones. And the number one cause of reversible dementias is polypharmacy. The cardiologist doesn't know what the pulmonologist is doing, who doesn't know what the gastroenterologist is doing, and there's a, just a bag, literally a grocery bag, of all these medications that a lot of older persons are on. This is where the annual Medicare wellness visit is so important. That visit is supported by the Affordable Care Act as a way to reduce the risk of polypharmacy by way of primary care people looking through all the stuff that you're on and saying, oh, you don't need this. It's kind of like the Elvis thing. Remember, I forgot which way it went, but Elvis couldn't sleep, so they gave him downers. But then he was too sleepy, so they gave him uppers. You know, it's just the prescription cascade kind of thing. Too many older people are misdiagnosed with dementia, permanent, irreversible, dementia, because they are on polypharmacy and it could be effectively treated if somebody just looked at the stuff that they're on. Vitamin B12 deficiency, it occurs in a number of gastric pathologies as well as gastric bypass surgery for obesity. B12 can look very much like Alzheimer's disease when deficient. There's a critical window of opportunity when you can correct the B12 deficiency. But if you miss that window of opportunity, if your primary care doctor misses that window of opportunity, then that chronic B12 deficiency will look almost identical to Alzheimer's disease. So we need better training for what are the reversible dementias versus the irreversible dementias. And there's a bunch of others you can consult later. Now, who should give the diagnosis? I taught. 4,000 medical students, I don't want to freak out the public here, but they're not all created equal, particularly <laughs> when it comes to rendering a dementia, a dementia diagnosis. You need experts. Not every neurologist is an expert in the dementias. Not every geriatrician, not every other you know, provider you can think about is an expert. You need to figure out who are the experts in your community and get referred to them and perhaps get a second opinion just to make sure there is no mistake. Now, who, how are you going to find that stuff out? Well, I'm sure this coalition of aging uh, uh, social change agents here is a great place that has a, a, a referral list that you can check out. You can always go to the Alzheimer's chapters that are all over the place. You can check out Dementia Capable Virginia, which George Worthington is pretty much running. And you can talk to the, the, the Virginia Dementia Services Coordinator, George himself. And there's George's contact stuff, if you didn't catch that from his earlier presentation. Go to the people who know about the diagnosticians that are out there, and don't necessarily trust your primary care doctor. We have, in the Anatomical Gift Dad program, lots of donors who are diagnosed with the terminal disease of dementia. And I say to myself, oh my God, well, what kind of dementia? And to me, they just worked out, well, they probably had some dementia problem going, and that was it, that they did not have the person referred to an expert. Next slide. 
Now, these are some of the irreversible dementias. There are many, many that are not here. There are a ton of dementias way beyond Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's, the most prevalent, and the most prevalent forms of Alzheimer's disease are the late onset that occurs when you're older, not the early onset that occurs in your 40s and, and so on and so forth. One to make it clear, yes, Alzheimer's disease for a diagnosis must have the memory impairment kinds of things and the other cognitive impairment things that we talked about earlier. But I want you to see with vascular dementia, one of the most secondary common uh, features for dementia, memory may not necessarily be affected in vascular dementia. So memory is affected in Alzheimer's, but not necessarily affected in vascular dementia. Most persons who have vascular dementia have small cells, uh, uh, vessels that are messed up, uh, rather than large uh, uh, major vessels that uh, are messed up. So small cell, uh, uh, small vessels types of vascular dementia are the most prevalent form of vascular dementia itself. Lewy body dementia. Persons with Lewy body dementia present with a Parkinsonian kind of gait, a shuffling, hunched over kind of gait, but do not necessarily have Parkinson's disease. They have vivid hallucinations. A good friend of mine was dying with Lewy body dementia, and he said there's a beautiful canary over there on the chair I know it's not there, but boy, it's a beautiful canary, and it's singing like you wouldn't believe. Uh, he was dying from Lewy body dementia. Uh, coincidentally, he was referred to Hopkins for expert review of his dementia. And may I say, the expert neurologist who was taking care of him was one of my former medical students. It was so cool to see one of my med students, a big chief when it comes to uh, dementia, refer. Frontal temporal. Uh, George has up there a whole booklet on frontal temporal dementia for you to check out. That's the one that's a caregiver's nightmare. In frontal temporal dementia, that's where the challenging behaviors really become quite problematic and difficult to deal with. And then, among others, is chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Those of us in the dementia world and in the brain injury world debate chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And some of us think it's a variant of frontal temporal dementia even if the New York Times is telling you otherwise that it's a big deal with NFL uh, football players, uh, that problem is an issue with NFL football players and repeated concussions, certainly not a good thing. But whether that's a separate form of dementia or a variant of frontal temporal dementia remains to be seen. There's not consensus among the experts. Okay, now, if you can't reverse the stuff, well then maybe we ought to think about trying to prevent the stuff. And this is the public health perspective I'm going to come to here in a moment. Now, let's uh, go back. Okay, next. So, if you do head-to-head -head counts, and this is as best I could do with apples to apples, in the 2017 death report, Alzheimer's disease is ranked as an important top 10 cause of death. But remember, that's only one type of dementia. So I've been begging and looking for all-cause dementia as a cause of death. And when you do the head-to-head -head comparison in 2017 before COVID, put all of the dementia deaths together, and that becomes the number three cause of death in the United States. Behind heart disease, cancer, comes the dementia. But we're so focused on isolating Alzheimer's and not incorporating the related dementias, that I think we lose sight of the uh, iceberg because we're focusing just on the tip of the iceberg itself. I just want to show you the relative changes at around the same time that related to causes of death. But in the box below is the most recent CDC stuff that uh, does not do the all-cause dementia stuff. <laughs> but as far as drug overdoses is concerned, please know not all drug overdoses are opioid fentanyl related. About three quarters are due to opioid related overdoses, but not 100%. I want you to appreciate that alcohol, alcohol kills way more Americans than all drug overdoses. Around 70% or more people killed by alcohol. In the geriatric world, alcohol is a very dangerous thing for persons on multiple medications with multiple morbidity to be taking. And there is, in fact, growing consensus. Get rid of alcohol, period, for all of us. 
way more people killed by alcohol than are killed by drug overdoses uh, themselves. And let's not forget suicide, around 50,000 people killed every year by suicide, slightly more than half by way of firearms. Certainly suicide is a public health epidemic. And older white men are the ones that are at greater risk for suicide. And so it's something we cannot forget. And with caregiver burden, caregiver stress, mental health issues, suicide has to be part of the equation for preventive strategies. All right, next. Now here's some of the distinguishing features of the dementias that I mentioned. I'd like you to understand something people don't understand. Alzheimer's disease is a woman's health disease. Two-thirds of persons with Alzheimer's are women. What's the next question? Why? But what we teach our medical students, if not explicitly, implicitly, all patients are white, middle-class, heterosexual men. And we got to get way beyond and appreciate the great diversities and disparities that are out there. So women, and then have certain protein markers like amyloid beta and a particular form of a tau thing and so on, and it's gradual and progressive uh, slows. Vascular dementia, mostly men. It's a male healthcare problem. Its onset can be with the large vessels, very rapid, very rapid, and then it progresses. Uh, we can talk about Lewy body dementia. There's two kinds. We can talk about Lewy body dementia itself, and the persons who have this have a biomarker called Lewy bodies, uh, named after a dead white guy named Lou, and uh, they have this characteristic pathology associated with that. Most of the persons who have Lewy body dementia and or Parkinson's disease dementia with Lewy bodies are men not women. So you see there are these gender differences. And the frontal temporal stuff, equal opportunity pathogen, could be a man, could be a woman. So I just want to show you there are different markers and different profiles that relate uh, to the common dimensions. Now, there are a whole bunch of theories for Alzheimer's. For a long time, it was all about uh, acetylcholine. And we're going to have these magic bullets that would promote brain acetylcholine, and they only have a small effect in the subpopulation of people. The predominant view is the amyloid beta cascade hypothesis. It's caused by those plaques that include amyloid uh, beta. And so that's the predominant view that many of us are trying to get beyond because check it out, there's a whole bunch of alternative perspectives on this, and this is where research is going to hopefully figure out where we, you know, I tried to turn my phone off, and obviously I didn't. Uh, sorry about that. So um, one of the areas that I'm very interested in is an energetics model, that cellular metabolism is messed up, and it's this whole view of a type of diabetes that affects the brain that might relate to this, a whole view of organelles within the cells called mitochondria that might relate to this. But this is a metabolism point of view. And when you say metabolism, nutrition should come into mind. Nutrition and metabolism. But for me, that's a very interesting perspective. The cardioprotective one, uh, item nine. What's good for the heart is good for the brain. So that's why I have a couple of hearts back there to show you a heart to compare with cardioprotective stuff as being Alzheimer's protective, and I'll have more to say about that here in a minute. And one of my favorite perspectives is the epigenetic hypothesis. You know, genes are expressed or not expressed by way of the genome itself, or by way of extrinsic factors. Lifestyle factors can turn on or turn off genes. And these lifestyle factors, like what you eat, whether or not you exercise, social affiliation, all that stuff, changes gene expression. And I love the idea that there are multiple hits changing gene expression, maybe starting as early as in utero, that accumulate and accumulate and accumulate, and you finally reach a threshold where it's like, okay, now I'm going to have Lewy body dementia, okay, now I'm going to have Alzheimer's dementia. And from that perspective, next, is are the first geriatricians the obstetricians? are adverse fetal events planting the seeds for dementias at the age of 60 or 70. We talk about the long progression, the long lead up to uh, becoming symptomatic with the dementias. Does that progression really start in, uh, in utero? 
That's a really interesting hypothesis that some people are considering right now. Now remember in science, Occam's razor, 10 to the simplest solution. The simplest solution is the one that is easiest to understand and attack. So what's the simplest solution for the war between Israel and Hamas? There is no simple solution. What's the simple solution for solving poverty? There is no one-size-fits-all stuff. So science is directed by Occam's razor, 10 towards a simple solution. Hence, amyloid beta must cause it. I think that's an oversimplification that the public needs to understand to a greater extent. And in the research world, we need to embrace in a greater extent. Next. All right, so let's do the paradigm shift that George Worthington and others are leading as related to dementia as a public health problem. Next. All right, so this is a partnership started by the CDC and the Alzheimer's Association of Related Disorders. And it was established by the BOLD Act. George told me he, had, he just recently got back from a national meeting of the BOLD Act recipients. And uh, we won't care about what the BOLD stands for, but in red, check it out. In 2018, when the Senate voted on it, unanimous. The Senate, those guys can't even agree on what to have for lunch, <laughs> let alone passing the bill. Unanimous, and only three turkeys in the House of Representatives out of however a couple hundred there are. Uh, voted against it. I've been meaning uh, to look who, who are those three turkeys, and I'm sure they're not associated with a genie attack. There's some kind of other hokies that are out there in one way or another. Amazing. And the Virginia version of this bold act that relates to the Healthy Brain Initiative is Healthy Brain Virginia. There's the hot link that is there, and talk to George at any time and all the time about all of the special uh, stuff that's going on with Healthy uh, Brain Virginia, which is run out of the Virginia Department of Health because it's a public health perspective. Next. All right, so I love this, and uh, there's a roadmap book that is back there, but this is the newest iteration of the roadmap to this dementia approach that is a public health approach. At the center is not amyloid beta, at the center, equity, equity, justice, equity, persons not having to have to suffer, and equity. I just love that focus on the person. Ultimately, that's the ultimate person-centered approach, equity. And then, if we could stay there, number two is these different domains. So what must dementia persons do? Broaden their partnerships, 2A. What else must they do? Get good outcome measures and do data-driven kinds of programs. Part three, build a better workforce. It's terrible in our nursing homes, for example, how understaffed we are with the principal professional caregivers in our nursing homes, certified nursing assistants. And the workforce relates ultimately to caregivers in general. And then in, uh, in yellow here is engage and educate the public whether it be on Capitol Hill, here in Culpeper, or middle school students, and have a, a greater dialogue about all of the complexity that relates to this. And then the outermost are the practices. So we need 3A, risk reduction. If we can't cure these things, well, let's focus more on prevention. That is the value width of public health. Public health very much focuses on prevention. How about in 3B, the idea of uh, having uh, uh, different uh, outcomes and deterrents, how about caregiving, and how about uh, community clinical linkages. Community clinical linkages include the kind that I see here at the library represented. We had, I mentioned earlier, business partnerships that are mentioned here. This is the roadmap there, way beyond amyloid beta. Some of us call those that push relentlessly the amyloid beta hypothesis we call them the A-beta mafia, because they are intolerant of other perspectives. Now, they don't like that term, but there are many other ways to view the dimensions, as I just showed, uh, showed you, and that includes this public health approach. Next. All right, here's the social determinants of health. That is public health. It is beyond whether or not you have a gene or whether or not you have uh, an infection. It's about access to care, health insurance, disparities, education, literacy, where you live, all of these things are critical determinants of 
health outcomes. In fact, it's been argued that more health uh, technologies can be explained from a public health, social determinants of health point of view than from a simple biological point of view, which is why, by God, if I have any chance of telling them, a pre-med student to drop biology and get into some of the other liberal arts, I'm going to do that every time I can, because the poor biology student is, again, going to see the world through the Krebs cycle. It's all Krebs cycle. Whereas the more liberal arts trained person is going to look at the social determinants of health and look at the uh, uh, ethical issues and so on and so forth. Next. Now, here's from a public health point of view. Alzheimer's more likely to occur in women. Why? We've got to do more research and figure that out. Alzheimer's more likely to occur in African Americans than Latino Americans. Why? We've got to do more research to figure that out. In Hampton Roads, there's an interesting partnership coming out of the Frederick Marshall College Fund for HB Historical Black Colleges and Universities and the Alzheimer's Association to get college students who are interested in health careers to partner with Alzheimer's chapters so that those HBCU minority health students will become community ambassadors to go out and promote the public education stuff that is part of the roadmap that is here. We did a survey on the 400th anniversary of the uh, birth of slavery in English-speaking North America a few years ago. And if you don't know where that was, it's where I live, Hampton, and where in Hampton, Fort Monroe in Hampton, is the birthplace of slavery in English-speaking North America. We surveyed some very highly educated participants in that uh, commemoration, and hardly any knew about Alzheimer's disparities. They knew about cardiac and diabetic and colorectal cancer disparities. Hardly any knew about this as a public health issue disproportionately affecting persons of color. All right, now I, I saw Ellen send out a message to remind us of uh, the profound statement of Rosalind Carter, Carter that we're all caregivers in November with Thanksgiving. It is a Caregiver Appreciation Month. Those of you who are walking in those shoes, Thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. <laughs> well, we need to do better training of our characters and how to deal with challenging behaviors. And the lessons learned in some areas, like intellectual disability, can very well be applicable to lessons learned for dementia characters. You've got to break down the silos in the spirit of public health. Now, we have here in Virginia a managed care program that is part of Medicaid expansion. That part of Medicaid expansion that is relevant to persons with dementia is cardinal care, managed care. It used to be called Commonwealth Community Care Plus. But what this part of uh, uh, cardinal uh, care, managed care is about is it's a person-centered medical home for people who have complex behavioral and neurological disorders. You want to know how many of my medical students have been taught this? None, because it's all gizmos, gadgets, and medications. The data that support this came from the Affordable Care Act demonstration grant here in the Commonwealth, and there are, it is a data-driven patients at a medical home, the more persons with the dementias and their caregivers need to learn about to help them uh, uh, more easily deal with the problems they are discussing. Next. Now, Tidewater Community Services Board out of Suffolk is the first community services board here in Virginia to do the following. Remember, community services boards are the terms for, in my opinion, have been focused on substance use disorder, serious mental illness, and intellectual disabilities. And so when persons with the dementias, persons with brain injuries, would approach the CSBs, they would be redirected to other places. But Western Tidewater Community Services Board now has a program a geriatric care program and a brain injury program to put it under the umbrella of the CSBs. It's a demonstration program right now for all of coastal Virginia, from uh, Franklin all the way up to the Middle Peninsula. Now, how did that happen? Advocates like those in this room said we need a better system of care, and improving systems of care is part of public health approach for the dementias, and that's how we got the brain injury and we got the dementia stuff empowered with the community service board in Western Ontario. Next, nursing homes. You want to see an outrageous situation in the most affluent country in the world? Check out our nursing homes. Uh, Kathy Walker is an ombudsman, there may be others here out there trying to defend uh, against abuse and neglect and approve 
our long-term care, including our nursing home facilities. In 2022, the National Academy said, our nursing homes are broken, and we can't wait to fix them. We've got to start fixing them right now. The way we finance them and all of that stuff is really quite problematic. So systems approaches are public health approaches, and boy, there is a real need to improve nursing homes where a significant fraction of residents have dementia. That's one of the major reasons persons get placed into nursing facilities. There is a pandemic of challenging behaviors that the staff have to deal with. At the same time, there are less staff than is necessary. And if you want to do a quantitative approach, in fact, at least 95% of all residents of nursing homes have some kind of behavioral health problem, if not dementia, mild cognitive impairment, intellectual disability, traumatic brain injuries, and so on. The vast majority of persons in our nursing facilities have behavioral issues. And when you have an emergency, you have some kind of pandemic, you have some kind of trigger, people predisposed to challenging behaviors are going to act out and cause enormous suffering for those persons and enormous suffering for the people that are trying to help them. And so staffing is an issue. So a whole bunch of people, like Kathy and others in the Ombudsman Organization here in the Commonwealth, pushed really hard for more staffing in our nursing homes. That's been a real tough sell because to hire more staff, you got to spend money. And in the private nursing home programs, which are assimilating like crazy, profits are indeed the motive because they are for-profit facilities. If they now have to hire more people, it's going to be a big deal. And this is from the Kaiser Family Foundation that effectively, if you want to increase certified nursing assistants or RNs, and your for-profit nursing facility, about 90% of them are going to have to hire more people, uh, a less percentage for those that are non-profit. If the dementia is a challenging behavior, is an important issue with nursing home care, and importantly related to that is poor staffing, then you can see the need, the pressing need for system change from a public health point of view in our nursing home facilities. Next. Now, this is the rusty truck theory of Alzheimer's disease. There are preventative things, there are uh, uh, pre-symptomatic things, and then gradually we end up with the end stages of Alzheimer's disease. And by the time, by the time you have the rusty truck, it's hard to put the tires together, hard to put the fender back on, pretty hard to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. So the real focus now is in the early pre-symptomatic stages of the dementia, as well as mild cognitive impairment. That's where a lot of research attention is being focused from a preventative perspective rather than from a restorative perspective. Next. So, The Lancet came out, a very fancy medical journal, in 2020 with modifiable risk factors that could prevent not just Alzheimer's but all of the dementias and reduce the global burden of dementia almost by half if we would just pay attention to these preventative factors. What are they? Lifestyle. Who knew good nutrition, exercise, social connectedness? Who knew those would be good for the brain? And how do we teach our medical students about lifestyle? We don't because they don't get reimbursed for you exercising a little bit more. There's not a prescription that they can give you for you trying to eat better. So we really neglect, from a public health point of view, the education of our clinicians and so far as the lifestyle stuff. They'll tell you if you're overweight, stop eating. Uh, or exercise more. They get oversimplified approaches rather than uh, embrace nutrition, inactivity, less education, and social contact. Depression. We need, if we want to prevent the risk of the dementia, intervene more aggressively from a public health point of view on the epidemic of depression that's out there. Traumatic brain injury. It's remarkable how few people in the traumatic brain injury world know that the major environmental risk factor for all forms of dementia is traumatic brain injury. We got Veterans Day coming up. Signature injury, injury for the war on terrorism includes TBI as well as PTSD. They need to be embracing, much more importantly, some of these lifestyle interventions than many of the rest of us are concerned. At least there needs to be public awareness. And then cardiovascular risk factors. It is pretty clear that what's good for the heart is good for the brain, what's bad for the heart is bad for the brain. So the standard uh, risk factors, diabetes, hypertension, and so on. 
And then hearing impairment, it's really interesting that there's a pamphlet back there. Hearing impairment, you know, is much more to hearing than the ears. Hearing is a brain thing. Remember Beethoven's, one of the greatest accomplishments in the history of humanity, was his Ninth Symphony? And he did that when he was deaf. Because you don't hear with your ears, you hear with your brain. And there's a whole lot of stuff in the brain, a lot of areas in the brain, that are related to auditory processing. So not surprisingly, hearing impairment is a risk factor by many authorities for the dementias, as it is for a variety of other pathologies, coincidentally. Okay, the mind diet. Much uh, discussed mind diet. What's up with that? It's a combination of the Mediterranean diet and dietary approaches to stopping hypertension, DASH diet. Those are diets that are high in fruits and vegetables and grains and fish and low in saturated fat and so on. And so the difference between the MIND diet, which is a combination of the Mediterranean and the DASH, from each of those respectively, is there's a greater emphasis on the MIND diet for green leafy vegetables, your spinaches and so on and so forth, and no recommended increase in fruits except for berries. Why that is, I, I don't know. But that's how Morris and others who developed the diet did it. And so it's kind of sort of a high fruits and vegetables, but not quite the same as a Mediterranean diet. And uh, it's been shown uh, to have uh, uh, protective effects, at least epidemiologically, in risk of cognitive decline. And it's even shown beneficial effects in persons with Parkinson's disease. Next slide. And so you can take this from the web. Here's my simple-minded way to allow you to eat a mind diet. And instead of using surveys, we'll use fist, fist of this or half a fist of that or whatever. So it's a simple-minded approach on how you could put your own mind diet together, which is going to be high in olive oil and uh, lots of uh, green vegetables and uh, low in uh, fried foods, uh, reasonable amount of fish, and so on. I want to point out, however, that it, is a, that it was originally designed for weight loss purposes. And the last thing you want to do for a person with advanced dementia who's already having a hard time maintaining body weight is put them on caloric restriction. You don't want to do that. And so to me, that's a problem with this because if you try to go follow this recipe, you're going to be hungry. And so you know what I do? I don't follow the recipe. Instead, it says for well, one fist, I'll put two fists in because I'm not worried about my body weight. If you want to use it for weight reduction, then this is what the recipe is next. All right, so the finger study. Oh my God, we heard everything under the sun about this amyloid antibody beta antibody treatment. How come in 2015 we never heard of the finger study? The finger study was in Finland, and it was a randomized controlled trial based on, are you ready for this? Lifestyle. And what was the combined lifestyle manipulation? A healthy diet, physical exercise, cognitive exercise, and social engagement. Who knew? Lifestyle would be so important. And they showed in a beautiful study, randomized controlled trial, the gold standard for science, a reduction in cognitive decline. So there's the, now the Worldwide Fingers Network group of investigators. And for the first time in the US, the approach, multi-domain lifestyle approach, for the prevention of Alzheimer's is being done by the so-called pointer study, funded with $20 million from the Alzheimer's Disease and Related Disorders Foundation. Very big thing, the pointer study. Next. Now, let's talk about other ways to exercise. We saw them this morning, right? You don't have to do high-impact stuff at the Y. You just move. It's a pretty simple way. Or, for example, dance. Remember that Gailey saying, you dance as if no one is watching, you sing as if no one uh, can hear. And what about moderate walking? A generation ago, the diabetes prevention trial took persons with prediabetes and said, just walk 30 minutes a day, five days a week, and watch what you eat. If you want to get the Snickers bar, replace it with an apple. And so they showed this amazing protection by this simple lifestyle approach and preventing conversion to diabetes. Diabetes is a major risk factor for Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. Why not simply focus on a little bit of walking? Some people are going to say, well, you need high-impact aerobic stuff 
with a gym coach and all this stuff. Yeah, maybe that would be helpful, but most of us can't do that. But we can always take a little walk and God forbid you have a dog, you get an excuse to go walk the dog every day, and so on and so forth. What about other ways to emphasize your brain? The finger study and others use computer kinds of games and enhancements. You've heard a lot about uh, card playing and uh, crossword puzzles. Sorry, I don't like any of that stuff. Other ways to exercise your brain, just think about how many ways you can do that by way of the arts. The human brain is an artistic brain, and the human brain is a creative brain, the arts. What a great way to exercise your brain. How about PBS? Man, I got great stuff on PBS. What about reading? Reading all kinds of different things. How about gardening? How about creating other kinds of things outside of the arts? What about coming to programs like this? Those are all really cool ways to exercise your brain. You don't have to restrict yourself to crossword puzzles or to computer games. And what about social engagement? How can you get more involved with friends and family? You gotta make intentional efforts to do that. And you gotta you know, reconnect with that friend of yours you haven't seen in 20 years. You gotta hang out with people, even people you don't know, by going to senior centers or going to other places where you can meet friends. And you could get some exercise and promote social affiliation by an Alzheimer's walk or a Parkinson's walk or working with homeless persons, or serving soup in a soup kitchen. There's so many ways that you can promote social engagement at the same time it promotes exercise and it promotes uh, other lifestyle factors next. All right, so I'm going to end now on our grant that we was re recently funded from the CDC. Thanks. The next slide. So here is the dialectic of behavioral problems. To understand a dialectic, you got to be a game of one like me, and we were all forced in college to read. Herman has a Sid Arthur. That was part of the requirements of us back in the day. And in Sid Arthur, a dialectic is simply explained this way. The river is always the same, and the river is always different. Combination of opposites. Depends on the level of analysis. The river's always the same, always the different. Always different. It is quite clear that challenging behaviors due to the many kinds of pathologies that I described earlier have unique and definitive pathophysiology that require unique and definitive specialized treatments of care and specialized medications, among other things. They're clearly different. Challenging behaviors with traumatic brain injury are clearly different from a pathophysiology point of view than our challenging behaviors due to the dementias themselves. But the fact of the matter is, there are similar effects of these challenging behaviors on caregivers, on systems of care, on cost of care, and simple things like, uh, 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 my friend Sonia is going to be commenting on later, person-centered care. Person-centered care by distracting people, by re-diverting their attention, by being kind and humane with them. Person-centered care works for all works for all. So the Alzheimer's Association support group training programs must include more person-centered care. Brain injury, uh, intellectual disability, all of these things need to embrace and learn more about the principles of person-centered care. Yes, these things are all different, but they're all the same in response to person-centered care. And person-centered care is high-touch, low-tech. Not a lot of gizmos, not a lot of gadgets, not a lot of medication. Just being kind and considered and supportive emotionally and physically, etc., of the persons you're taking care of. So here's some of the principles, in the interest of time, I'll skip over that, but social support in a nursing facility or at home, issues that relate to other forms of support. It's not rocket science. Remember, rocket science is for wimps. It's certainly not neuroscience, which is the last frontier restaurant. Pretty simple stuff, actually. Person-centered care that needs to be embraced to a greater extent. So we developed the program through support from the CDC, called Compassionate Crisis Care. What do you do when your loved one flips up because of a pandemic, because of a disaster? And ours is focused on nursing homes, but it could easily as well be focused on homes. When there's a change in environment for persons who have uh, behavioral issues, that can be a major trigger. And so what do you do? Well, sometimes, sadly, you call up the sheriff, and the sheriff, sheriff comes and handcuffs your loved one, and surprise, surprise, puts them in jail, which is 
the most expensive, least effective place to deal with that kind of stuff. Although I will say now, in the Commonwealth, there's a major movement related to crisis mobility uh, teams that are trained in person-centered care, crisis intervention techniques, and instead of police or with police, will go and deal with these persons who have challenging behaviors, try to calm them down and take them to treatment programs rather than uh, to uh, uh, incarceration kinds of settings. So what happens is we're focusing on simple positive behavior controls for the benefit of certified nursing assistants who are really facing the brunt of the challenging behaviors. Or they're burnt out and they're quitting, and we're trying to empower them by teaching them some of these person-centered skills approaches and also promoting mental health wellness uh, training and other ways so that we don't have as much staff turnover. But we're also forming separate videos with EMS through the direction of the head of EMS, Emergency Medical Services in here in Virginia. We have a separate video on the Virginia Medical Reserve Corps. If you have nothing else to do, man, join the Virginia Medical Reserve Corps. You'll meet some of the coolest people on earth, and they're going to go to emergency situations of one type or another. So with the head of the Virginia Medical Reserve Corps, we put together a separate training video. We're in the process now of putting a training video for law enforcement. So they don't make the situation worse, they make the situation better. And then our last training video will be for nursing home administrators and for uh, nursing home regulators themselves. Here is our partnership. This is uh, the public media station in Richmond, VPM. Uh, if you haven't seen the PBS documentary series on dementia, check it out, and it comes from these people. Award-winning documentary series on dementia, PBS National. Uh, so we're very lucky to have them as partners. And we have our EVMS standardized patients where actors model Alzheimer's, actors model brain injuries. And we try to have the perspective of some of these people from the point of view of a person with dementia or with a brain injury. So can you imagine you have advanced dementia and somebody's in your face looking like that? That's not going to make you feel calm. That's going to be a trigger. And so we have ways to have the certified nursing assistant and others try to calm the environment and so on. Next. So here's where I took you. We talked about this amazing thing called the brain. And it's incredible propensity for suffering and pathology as well as for great joy. We talked about the epidemic of behavioral and neurological disorders that are out there. In a position to bankrupt our country, particularly just the behavioral stuff itself, most costly health care problem is not dementia. The most costly health care problem is substance use disorders. You'll see some Alzheimer's Association literature saying most costly health care problem in America is the dementia. It's not. It's uh, substance use disorders which can increase the risk, coincidentally, of uh, dementias in general. We talked about memory loss can occur in short-term memory. That's a normal part of aging. But we said mild cognitive impairment is a form of memory loss that is more severe and not a part of normal aging. And we said memory loss itself is not necessary for the diagnosis of all dementias. It's necessary for Alzheimer's, but for example, natural uh, 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 vascular dementia. We talked about this paradigm shift that George is a national leader on that relates to getting way beyond the amyloid beta-centric hypothesis for Alzheimer's disease to embrace systems of care and health disparities and prevention approaches and a lot of stuff that heretofore has not been at the front of our dementia uh, our battle. And then we talked about challenging behaviors and the critical need for more persons to be treated with person-centered care principles, not least of which would be the caregivers who are in this world. Okay, I'm done. I'm, I'm sure I'm not late, and uh, yes, I did. So, but I never look at a clock because it's going to freak me out, and I know I'm going to be going late. So, I'm, I'm sorry for that.